literally haven't even begun the video yet and I'm already frustrated. Okay then, Sir Cole. <laughs> I just thought of Sir Cole. Circle. Circle. <laughs> Hi everyone, it's Kiki and today we're going to be watching, uh, what's it called again? The Night Before Christmas. From a history student's perspective, let's begin. I really, when I saw a bunch of reviews of this movie out, I thought I'd do one too because I feel like a lot of people who, I watch a lot of reaction videos actually for movies and stuff, but I thought about watching this and giving you my take on it just to see how things would be, just because I feel like there aren't very many education-based responses to these kind of movies. I don't have high hopes for this movie. Oh my god. <laughs> uh, I've got the, the like commentary on it's like medieval music playing. <laughs> Okay, gotta stop there. December 18th, 1334. Norwich. Okay, I've never been to Norwich personally, but I have a couple friends who live in Norwich. <laughs> Some East Anglians we know. 1334. Contextually, let's look at this. This is a couple years before the Black Death hits England. So 1348. So this is a little while before that. Edward III was ruling at this time. The succession of the three Edwards. This is kind of after a period of a lot of crusades. In the second half, half of the 14th century, very much the latter of Edward III's rule. There's a massive decline in warfare, so early on I believe there was quite a bit of warfare. So this is a war-heavy-ish kind of time. I'm seeing what is meant to be Norwich Castle. If you've done history and you've studied English history, you should know what Norwich Castle looks like. This is not it. I mean, they tried. They did try, but I think I remember reading that this movie was filmed in Canada as opposed to being filmed in Norwich so maybe it was cost cutting looking at what Norwich Castle's supposed to look like this this ain't cutting it really no but I'm gonna be I'm gonna be positive all right indeed good soft wind that is not <laughs> see I don't know what I expected because I don't understand how these people go about researching these movies because first of all what they're wearing now i'm no bernadette banner so i can't give you loads of historical knowledge about clothing because i don't know it but i have done some research i mean it just looks like cheap armor doesn't it like you're just looking at these they got sort of red cape like looking things whereas we know for a fact at least in the 14th century knights did not wear kind of cape type things there were no cape things of any sort. It was just a bodice, which I'll pop up on screen. You can Google it, it's so easy to find. Um, it's just very odd. They had under garments that they'd wear, which were made of cloth, and then they had the armor that went on top. Now the armor itself, also I do not know where these capey, flowy, roby thingies are coming from, because that was just not a thing. The thingies they've got here, could be considered accurate. However, I think they've got them right, but they just look very cheap in this movie. You know what this is? I figured out this is what you would Google medieval knight Halloween outfit, and this is the kind of crap that would show up, and this just shows how much budget went into their costume. I need to hear them speak some more, but from the very first lines, it's received pronunciation. For those of you who don't know, received pronunciation is an English accent that is used while you are performing either on stage, it is what people think is the typical British accent. It's very posh, and that's probably why they used it. <sighs> this is where my being an English student comes in. It wouldn't have sounded like that. And I, I know we're gonna have to suspend our disbelief to watch this movie, but as someone who's watching it to see if it's historically accurate, it's not. Middle English is what was spoken. It's not that difficult to understand if you've got kind of the translations and stuff beside you, because we studied Chaucer this past semester. Very much medieval language, while it wasn't all poetry like Chaucer, we do know that how they spoke was very 
very different to received pronunciation and to modern English. I'll play you some, actually. One that April with his sure sort, the drucht of March hath pierced to the road. Accents like the Scottish accents are very much nearer to what Middle English would have sounded like. Being in Scotland and living here, you kind of learn to get that. And you get this by trying to read Chaucer out loud as well. It's very entertaining for me to read out loud as I learn. So Chaucer did introduce many new words into the language, but there were definitely words that were in everyday use. And we can also look at documents of the time. We kind of know how things would be pronounced because things were lit written phonetically. We have a very important document from the 13th century. I hope I'm pronouncing this right, Ormulum. So it was a biblical text written by a monk called Orm from northern Lincolnshire and it's, sorry, it's late 12th century, early 13th century, but it's such an important source because he spelt words exactly how they were pronounced. We're able to now look back and see how, for example, Chaucer's works would have been pronounced. Also, because they have some French loan words, we know how those would be pronounced. I'll insert some typical 14th century dialect and what they sounded like right here. So then the sage and the assault was sated at Troy, the Borg, Britain and Brent, to Brondas and Oscars. And thus you can see that it really is not the same whatsoever. Back to the movie. How much have I watched? Less than a minute. This is ideal. Gather round for the annual Christmas hawking competition. Wait, did they just say Christmas hawking competition? Hold on. Hawking competition. Hawking competition. Medieval hawking was the ancient sport of hunting small wild game or birds with trained birds of prey. Favourite pastimes for medieval upper classes including nobles and English royalty. This is important. It says brave knights and squires taking part. No, 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 no. Squires would not be taking part. They are not upper class society. They're not royalty or nobility. Why would they be taking part? This is so historically inaccurate. Now knights. It is very possible there were two classes of knights, the lower and the upper class of knights. Now the lower would definitely not be a part of this. It's not that nobles couldn't be knights, but it's that it was very rare. I think what a lot of people consider knights are the king's knights. The king's knights were not even established till 1359. This is 1334, wouldn't have existed. This video is just gonna be me being triggered the whole time. <laughs> King Edward King III. Edward yes, correct. Thank you. If that had been wrong, oh my word. Oh my I God. want your love, my prince. What kind of a girl in high school honestly thinks that their boyfriend is a prince? What kind of girl? That's all it is. A fantasy. All men are trash. That, that's, that's the message of this movie. Well, honey, I didn't have to watch this to know that. You can ride my horse. I'll lead the way. You can ride my horse. Oh my word. I, that Honestly, I wish I could go back in time just to see the look on a knight's face if I told him that they'd been interpreted as letting someone else ride their horse. Now this is time to start off with some interesting terminology, which I have noted down because I thought it would be interesting. What was a knight? So in this period, pre-1360s, there were two types of knights, household knights and chamber knights. There were much fewer chamber knights and then they went on to replace the household knights entirely. The idea of a king's knight was also generated. The way of knights and their function as providing military service to the king as bound in royal service was well established by 1300 so beginning of the 14th century there were two ranks of knight like I said now I'm gonna delve into them the upper rank which was bannerets and the lower rank of simple household knights under the three Edwards Edward the third is course reigning at this period of time. Household knights were expected to accompany the king on military expeditions or campaigns. 85 to 95 percent of the household knights went. Morgan has called the 14th century the great age of English chivalry and thereby knights. So this was the golden age of knighthood, meaning that there would be a lot of knights at this period and after this it kind of dwindles. That's not our focus right now. I think we also should talk about chivalry for a little moment. We'll pop the definition up. Chivalry 
is not what the modern day term chivalry of a man basically being courteous towards a woman is. While courtesy was one of the things that made a knight chivalrous, it was not the determining factor. There was wisdom, worthiness, piety, helping those in need, courage, honour, justice. But one thing I think should be highlighted and stressed is a lot of people kind of look at, let's say, Le Mort d'Arthur, which is basically King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. A lot of ideals of knights at the time, like Sir Gawain and Chaucer's knight, people tend to forget that knights were quite violent. They had begun to be a bit of a problem, not in this current time. And we must remember, these men were trained to kill a lot. There were very few of them, but they could create a lot of damage. They were famous for being mercenary and pillaging. I also think we shouldn't get too caught up in this oh, romantic ideal of, oh, this like knight in shining armor coming to save me because really that just wasn't the case. Become a true knight. We know he's gonna end up with the girl because this is a Christmas movie about a medieval knight time traveling, historically. A true knight. <sighs> this begs the question, what is a true knight? We have just mentioned literally everything. And funnily enough, none of those involve time traveling to the future and mm, marrying Vanessa Hudgens. Falling in love with a girl is not what a true knight is meant to do. A true knight is meant to go into war with his king and be victorious in battle while also being courageous, gallant, and just. What might that be, my name? This is not Abercrombie and Fitch circa like 2013. Like, calm down. Oh, oh I'm so sorry. Yes, because the first thing you do when someone spills something on you is lick it to see what it is. It's no harm done. It's, um, very impressive armor. Really. <laughs> I love, I love how the, the script was like, we have to authenticate how shitty our budget is for costume design. So we're going to have a line in it that says, wow, that armor looks real authentic. <laughs> What? It gads? It gads. <laughs> Why don't you uh, sit in the back of my uh, steel horse and I- Sir Lyons of Norwich did not say anything about a steel horse to Officer Stevens, yet he called his own car a steel horse. What? They wouldn't have been able to understand one another. The accent would be so weird that neither of them would be able to understand what the other one was saying. <sighs> oh, now this is fascinating. We can now see what is under his ridiculous armor, the inauthenticity of it. Mm, not accurate. The design of this team just said fuck it and we'll go with generic what people think it'll look like. So the wheel acts as the reins and the pedals at your feet control the steed's speed. Again, we're meant to suspend our disbelief, but a 14th century knight would not just understand things like a car really easily. Like, it's not like it's common sense, it's progression of technology by 600 years. <laughs> It's like they decided to take all these weird words that probably were not used at this time either. Hmm. Let's see, the origin of Bajabers was the early 19th century. Where is this knight from, did you say? Was it the 14th century? No. It just, mm, inconsistency. Bajabers, what was that other word they said earlier? Igad, yeah. Origins late 17th century once again way off by a couple of centuries it's just it bothers me when they have a script writer who probably made quite a decent amount of money for this i could write something better in my sleep and this is not me tooting my own horn i bet someone i bet oof, i don't even know what to say if they just got someone who was interested in doing a smidge of research they would have ended up with a movie 10 times better easily steady now milady milady occurred in 1778 what might this mutilated mess be guys there's an 
hour of this movie left. That is a nice coat. I want that coat. If anyone can get me that coat. Thank you for your wise counsel, Father Christmas. Right. <laughs> English personifications of Christmas were first recorded in the 15th century, with Father Christmas himself first appearing in the mid-17th century in the aftermath of the English Civil War. Now, Mate's story is that every year he was allowed to go back to his family for Christmas, but back then they did not celebrate Christmas. <laughs> See ya. Toodle pip. Early 20th century. That's even worse. This is just, it just keeps getting worse. This movie just keep progressively keeps getting worse. Where did you learn how to bake? As a squire, I was assigned for a time to the kitchens. Squires were not in the bakeries. Knaves were. Especially squires would just carry the king's sword and armor. They really had nothing to do with baking or cooking or anything like that. Oh. You really are a renaissance man, aren't you? Oh my god, renaissance and medieval. Two very different things. This is so painful. <laughs> While this part of the movie is going on, because I feel like this is just not at all significant to any of what we're going to be talking about. Um, so I'd just like to mention that Edward III had knights who had great military reputations. Walter Morney and Reginald Cobham, household knights, were first and foremost military retainers. You must remember in this period, there was a great need for military support as the Hundred Years' War began in 1337. Political tensions should be present at this moment. Laurie Fink and Martin Schichtmann have noted how knighthood was a system that sought to bring violence under control. Control. Now, if we compare Chaucer's knight to this presentation of a knight, absolutely ridiculous. Chaucer's portrait is an idealization of a knight, but it also seems carefully constructed. He presents this idea that knights could be mercenary, especially during crusading times. The key concepts of knights, as I mentioned before, were wisdom and worthiness. The word worthiness is repeated by Chaucer a lot for added emphasis meaning more than bra just bravery. Also accounted for their skill, their abilities, and experience in warfare. The chivalric values, honor, freedom, and courtesy, and the famous description of a very perfect gentle knight. Gentle doesn't mean the gentle that we think of it now, but as in true and honorable. There was a worry that knights were growing to become an uncontrollable class that needed to be channeled towards the right cause. As I said before, violence and pillaging had been prevalent before. Chaucer directly wrote from his own experience of life in the royal households of Lionel of Antwerp, John of Gaunt, and of course Edward III. So he would have seen in the field all the great knights of the early triumphant phase of the Great War with France. When Chaucer described the rigours of the lives of knights on horseback, he knew what he was talking about as he had accompanied them on many expeditions. You mean to tell me that single-handedly capturing a thief still isn't quest-worthy? Stopping a thief is a quest. Like, have you not read any medieval literature, anything, any tales? Have you not looked at King Arthur at all? Oh, they're gonna kiss now, isn't it true? <sighs> no, they're not. <laughs> Misdirect channeling Dylan. This is sad. She's uh, crying, but like, uh, it's been five days, sis. Sherwin. You know who's like the absolute icon of this movie? Sherwin. This this horse, this fucking horse, is the icon of this entire movie. Prove me wrong. Fight me. <laughs> Huzzah! Let us celebrate. love how terrible these terms are. The woods of Norwich. Boom, 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 boom. I have lost the plot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Love is the first and foremost of all nightly virtues. Sis. 
Love is the first and foremost of the knightly virtues. Are you shitting me? Are you actually shitting me? Slugs. No, it, it fucking is. It just fucking is not. It just is not. It. <laughs> no, Claire Bear. She's not been called Claire Bear this entire movie. But seven minutes left is the time to start. Me clapping that this movie is over. <gasps> Written by Cara Russell. Cara, listen, mate, we're gonna have some chats here. You and me, Cara, Cara. We're gonna end this video. Thank you for watching. We will be back to our regular content once the semester begins again. Tom will be filming his own video next week as well. I hope you've all had a lovely Christmas and a lovely new year. If you want to see more content like this from either of us, please do let us know. Even though it was very infuriating, I did enjoy doing that quite a lot. So if you enjoyed this, give us a like, subscribe, leave a comment down below. It really helps our channel. And uh, thank you for supporting us. Bye. How shit of a writer do you have to be to write some, something like this? Genuinely. Oh my lord, this is... So Ew. My question is, do you know if it's true love in five days? Like, do you? I think you can really have a vibe, um, a connection with someone in five days, but I don't think you can, you can't fall in love with someone in five days. That's ridiculous. Like, I would have liked this movie better if he had stayed. And then she meets, like, someone who looks like him, but, like, who's from that day and age and is still like a really good guy. That would have been a way nicer end to this movie. But like, of course we have to be cliche.